And I think we're live on Facebook. Well, you know, I was telling uh, Brother James earlier, it seems kind of odd not preaching a series. We just did a whole series on the book of Revelation. And then uh, last week we talked about salvation made plain and simple. And I got to thinking, what would be a very interesting subject for today that I think would inspire us to become more of a witness for Christ? So I asked one of the ladies of our church to donate her shoe today. And so, Lady Carol, thanks for donating the shoe, right? So I'm going to be talking about being a human in your own shoes. Being a human in your own shoes. And before the services, I asked several of the congregation, you know, how could you make a sermon out of this? You didn't have a Bible, and uh, you, you weren't at a church, but yet all you had was a shoe. Then you've got enough to start. So this is a great way. It's very interesting, especially for young people. I think it would be interesting for you, too. Uh, this is being a human in your own shoe. So uh, I'm going to call this the gospel shoe. Okay? And so in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, and we want to welcome you that have came out today to, to be faithful to this ministry, to the Lord, and, and what an encouragement it is that you are to me on a personal level. So I appreciate you being here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, it says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about shoes. You wouldn't have thought that, but it has a lot to say about shoes. In fact, uh, it talks about in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, the shoes of reverence. In, in Exodus 3, 5, and he said, draw not nigh hither, but he says, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. So the Bible talks about the shoes of reverence. You know, we, if we can ever get back to realizing that this is not just a building, it's a place that's been set aside to reverence God. And we ought to know uh, the importance of, of having a, a time together. And Ephesians uh, 10, 25 says, Not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of such is. So once again, but exhorting one another so much more you see the time approaching. So once again, people don't realize how important it is that, uh, uh, that we have shoes of reverence, that we really reverence the Lord and we reverence each other and we reverence our time together. And even Brother James is studying of the, of the inerrant word of God. So shoes of reverence. Number two, shoes of business. And Ruth Chapter 4, verse 7. Now this was the manner of the former time in Israel concerning redeeming, concerning changing. Uh, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. So Lady Carol, she plucked off her shoe. She gave it to me as a testimony. And so that was shoes of business. So uh, Lady Carol, if we were doing business... And I wanted to, let's say, for example, that I, I bought something of, of, of great wealth, but I didn't have enough to pay for all of it. I'd give you a down payment. How many of you know having a shoe back in those days was everything? I mean, you're talking about the desert. You're talking about uh, thorns and thistles. And, and so your shoes were very valuable. So it'd be like, here, I'm going to give you my shoe. And then you hold on to that. So once again, Ruth chapter 4, verse 7. And then when I bring you the rest of the money, I hope I'll get my shoe back, right? So, uh, and yes, you'll get your shoe back at the end of the service, okay? <laughs> but shoes of business. And, let's, and, and then there's the shoes of deceit. And Joshua chapter 9, verse 5. And old shoes and clouded upon thy feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. Hey, there's nothing worse than uh, uh, Lady Carol, I, I was talking to you a while ago, and somebody popped off and said, does it stink? So I put my hand in, and I said, it's not that bad. But have you ever found a shoe that maybe you left outside and it got wet and it molded? Or maybe you've ever gone fishing. In Texas, you go fishing, you step off in that old muddy river, and if you don't clean it up, how many know, boy, the next day, whoo, that thing, listen, it's a fly's delight. I mean, you can sit them outside and it'll collect flies. I'm just telling you, but it's a, you think, well, that's my shoe. 
But then you don't realize how bad it stunk and how moldy it became. And so Joshua 9, 5, And old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. But there's a, there's a sermon in that by itself. But there's shoes of reverence, shoes of, of business, shoes of deceit. There's a shoes of miracles. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 5, And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes are waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. Another miracle. You see, so we're going to be using uh, her, your shoe today at, uh, as a miracle shoe. We're going to bring in, give you a story that goes with it that I hope that, will, that you can share with your children, your grandchildren, and, and, and even the people you work with. Hey, I can just see you. That's going to work. And, and during the lunch break, you pull off your shoe. Now, don't wear your boots. You've got to wear your shoe and say, hey, guys, let me tell you, this is a story that my pastor told us about. And you can be a witness right there on the spot. But uh, then there's a shoes of the Christian soldier in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, which was our text for today. And, and it says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, every shoe, now here's, here's the outline. Uh, jot this down. When you're talking to your children, your grandchildren, or somebody you work with, or it's just a great illustration. Hey, first of all, every shoe, you look at it and realize it has a maker. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 through 29, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. In other words, he distinguished them. And God blessed them and said unto them, number one, he says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. So once again, God, not only uh, when we look at the shoe, Maddie, uh, it's, and everything, we realize it had a maker. Now, Starla, I know that you're in the medical industry, and I know Lady Carol, you are, I am. And uh, you cannot look at the human body and not realize, man, it's a miracle. Just the, the ability to see, even today, how the eyes work. Uh, it, it still blows scientists away. Uh, we're always discovering new things about the human body. And when you look at DNA and how it uh, uh, recapitulates in the RNA and how the body goes in and begins to, to build a defense against even the, the viruses that we've got today. And it's called herd immunity. It's what, that's why we need to get together from time to time and be safe in what we're doing. But at the same time, you need to realize we can, our body is designed to, to ward off the diseases that come our way. But it's going to be done in a natural way, a way designed by God. So once again, uh, we look at, at, at a shoe and realize it had a maker. When I look at human beings, I realize we too had a maker. And then number two, uh, that shoe uh, was made for a purpose. You see this right here. Uh, anybody ever tried to use this as a hammer? You ever tried to do that? Why, my mama used to use it for something more than that. <laughs> you know, my mama pulled her shoe off. We knew we were in trouble. All right. So once again, it had a purpose. And, and, and a shoe is not made to sit in a shoe box. A shoe is not to be displayed in a show window for its entire life. Uh, it is not to be to fill up a shoe store just to have a shoe on the shelf. And, and man's chief purpose is not just to sit in a church building. It's not just a nothing. What are you saying? Man's chief purpose is to serve God, to love God forever, and to try to benefit all of mankind. So what does the Bible say about a man's purpose? That God is God and he works all things, including your life, according to what? His purpose. So nothing can happen without God ordaining it. We know that. Psalms 57 verse 2, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose 
in me. How many times have I run across someone that I'm counseling with? They, they're at the place, a crossroad in their life, darling. They, they feel like, well, I have no purpose. And a lot of times when you become an empty nester and your kids move out, your grandkids are gone, a lot of people, a lot of grandparents, they go through this emotion, this, this time of, of limbo. And they say, you know, as long as I had someone to take care of, someone I could love, love me back, I felt like I had a purpose. But when you lose that connection, now I say that for this. Uh, I have a real good friend of mine, and, and uh, we, we both enjoy the entertainment industry together. And, and he said, yeah, he, ran, he got to meet his brother for the first time in a long time. And he said, since February of this year, his bro brother and his brother's wife have not left their home uh, but maybe five times total. And they're so secluded, living in fear. And I'm telling you, uh, it's one thing to do social distancing. It's another thing to distance yourself from all social. So be careful with that these days. Realize that, hey, listen, we're, I, I saw a deal on Facebook, and I thought it was kind of humorous. And, uh, and, of course, it's the way my mind works. But somebody posted a deal about, hey, there's a, a 0.01% of rain in the forecast. And he, and he said, I'm so angry that, that nobody is carrying around an umbrella. Okay, you'll understand that. He, he, I know he's kind of doing a, a, a little symbolism of that. About, uh, and I'm not making lightly. I know that the coronavirus is very serious. I, I know that. I've got friends who have gotten it. And, uh, and I realize all of that. But you see, if we look at a, a, a 0.01% and say, well, let's just... You know, distance ourselves from life, there's a problem with that. We're always going to have diseases. We're always going to have ups and downs. And, but you, it's one thing to do social distancing, but don't distance yourself from enjoying life. Matty, I was so glad y'all got to go uh, walking and camping and up, up north from us. And my wife and I just took a day off. And, and boy, was it when we came back, just that one day, that one day of refreshing ourselves, man, it was like spending a week at a resort somewhere. It was like going out and just say, we can breathe again. So remember that God is God and he works all things, including your life, according to his purpose. So you can't live life without a purpose and exist in a balanced life. Uh, Psalms 57, 2, I'll repeat it again. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose in me. Realize today that like a shoe, you've got a purpose. This is the key of understanding God's purpose in your life, that God gives you a purpose, all right? So the question is, Brother James, are you fulfilling your purpose? So what, what is my main purpose in life? That's the question I have for myself. And it's a question I hope you'll consider for you. Uh, let me, I posted this on Facebook this morning, and I'd like to read it to you at this time. Your life purpose consists of the central motivation aims of your life. The reason you get up in the morning. Now I want you to write that down. Purpose. The reason you get up in the morning. Purpose. Can guide you in your life's decisions. Purpose. Can influence your behavior. Purpose. Can help you shape your goals. Purpose offers a sense of direction and purpose in creating meaning for your existence. For some people, purpose is connected to a vocation, meaningful, satisfying work. Uh, others, maybe to raising a child or helping to raise grandchildren. Others, to, to being in the medical field, to benefit all of mankind. And others, for preaching the gospel. And, and yet the list goes on and on. But here's the key. Be the reason somebody smiles. Be the reason somebody feels loved and believes in the goodness in people. Now, I want to make that statement for a reason. We look at social media. We watch the news. And everybody, because of a handful, compared to a nation, because of a handful of people that seem to have no regard for a human life or life itself as we know it exists, they're allowing that small speck, 
that covers our United States of America and our globe to keep them from realizing that there are still some good people out there. There's still some honest people who value you and value your life. I'm not saying stop being cautious. You ought to be cautious of your surroundings. I understand that. But be, I, want, I want to be the reason why somebody smiled today. I want to be the reason why somebody felt like they were actually valued and loved. And they believe in the goodness of people. So be careful when all you do is saturate your mind with the negative. You know, I wish we could take a day where you could only post positive things on Facebook. You could only post positive things on Instagram. You could only speak positive things. Wouldn't that be a great day? But today we're filled with such negativity and fear. It is crippling us as a society. Now listen to this. Before you call yourself a Christian, before you call yourself a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Hindu or any other theology, learn to be human first. Did you get that? Somebody says, well, I'm a Baptist. I, I want to know if you're human. Well, I'm, 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 a, I'm a Buddhist. I want to know if you're a human. Because here's the deal. I believe, again, before you call yourself a Christian, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Hindu, or any other theology, learn to be human first. When someone you love dies, you are given the gift of a second chance. Now, what did you say, preacher? When somebody has someone they loved and that person dies... You have a second chance. What does that mean? Their eulogy. When we gather together and there's the coffin or there's the urn that's there or the pictures there that are representing that person, uh, it's a reminder that the living can turn their lives around at any point. You are not bound by the past. That is who you used to be. You are reminded that your feelings are not who you were and, 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 uh, and what you are, but how you felt at that moment. And here's a lesson I had to learn, is that your bad choices defined you yesterday, but they do not define you today. Your future does not have to travel the same path with the same people. You can start over. So when you have at a funeral, people are, are forced to say, that was my past. I was with that person, but they're no longer here. Oh, I'm going to have to start over. You know what that is? It's an opportunity to start over. You do not have to apologize to people who reject you. Let me say that again. You do not have to apologize to people who reject you. You do not have to justify your feelings or your actions during a difficult time in your life. If you're like me growing up, I did not take disaster 101. I did not take divorce 101. I did not take rejection 101. These are things I had to learn on my own on the road of hard knocks. How about you? Can somebody say amen? So you do not have to justify your feelings or your actions during a difficult time in your life. You do not have to put up with the people that are insecure and want you to fail because they'll always remind you of your failures. All you must do is walk forward with a positive outlook and trust that God has a plan. Trust that God has a plan that is greater than the sorrow that you left behind. Trust that God has a greater plan than the broken heart you left behind. Trust that God has a greater plan than the emptiness that you experienced at that time. The people of quality that were meant to be in your life will not need you to explain the beauty of your heart, nor will they continue to shame you for the actions of your past. They will just, I've always told people this, if you really want to be my friend, here it is, love me through thick and thin, here it is, and in spite of my sin and hopefully and I pray that maybe going through a time in your life where you've experienced that that you realize that there's a better life a better road and you're making better decisions today 
You see, they already understand that being a human is a roller coaster ride of emotion, especially, Lady Carol, during the rainstorms and the sunshine, the sprinkling with moments when you can almost reach the stars, moments when life was sucked out of you, and the moment you put breath back into your life, when you finally realize that you have value and that you are human too. All things are possible with Christ, the Bible says. So what do you do? You give Him a chance to show you how valuable you are. I look out this morning, and I, we're, we're a small church, I know that, in number. But I looked out and I saw each and every one of you, and, and I tried to explain to our congregation, you have no idea how valuable your attendance is to this preacher today. And so please remember this, you always have value to somebody Romans 10, 13, it talks about how that we're, we're to, to, to accept Jesus. To, you know, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You should accept Jesus as your Savior. And then yield your life to loving and serving that Jesus. And to try to be a blessing to all of mankind. So what do you do? Matthew, you define your purpose. What was I created for? What is my destiny going to be? If money were not an option... What would you do? Lady Carol, if money wasn't an option, what would you do? She said, well, I'd like to buy my shoe back, right? But I'm going to give it back to you. But here's the deal. You see, my purpose now at this stage in my life, Dustin, is to end well. That's, that's where I'm at right now. To present the gospel to everyone I can, Maddie, as often as I can. And to be the husband and the mate that my wife should have. And to be the friend that will never let you down. To be the last one you can call on when, when all your options have ran out. And start out to be the one to hold your hand when your heart is broken. To be the one, Lady Carol, who can tell your darkest secrets to and still know that you have a friend that loves you and does not judge you. They're just glad that you're in their life. To be the one who is uh, there from birth, teen years, older years, elderly, elderly years, and even to the grave to praise God for having you in our lives. And as a minister, I've been around long enough that some of our congregation, they were teenagers who then became parents, and, and then they went through life, went through ups and downs, and now they've got kids, so now they've, they're grandparents now who kids had kids and, and then all of a sudden uh, they come to me and say hey, preacher would you we're going to get married would you marry us that moment's grand but then there'll be people who come to me and say preacher I'm a, I was just told I've got six months to live and I need to prepare for the end and would you help me to prepare and then we get to the end and they say listen would you do my funeral uh, we had a young man that uh, years ago that that's exactly what happened he had cancer and I'd, I'd done a gospel illustration, and it made sense to him, and he got saved. And, and after that, uh, uh, he wanted to get baptized, and, and the doctor said, no, you can't do that. He said, Pre preacher, preacher. I said, yeah, buddy, what is it? He said, what does the Bible say? And I said, well, the Bible says that after you get saved, and if there's, you need to take and make a, co a public commitment, and that's through baptism, and start going to church. And he said, well, I'm going to do that. And his mama said, we got to let him do that. So we, we made sure everything was clean. We baptized him and everything else. He came out of that water. He used to paint. Started, he painted pictures that were very dark and gloomy. But after he got saved and made a commitment, a public commitment to Christ, I still got one of his pictures. Man, it's got sunshine. It's got clouds. And I mean, what a change came across that young man. Then we get down to the last few moments and and, he, and we made an agreement that if he goes on to be with the Lord before I do, that he would ask Jesus to help me in my ministry. And, and vice versa, that if I went before him, he would make a, a uh, uh, that God would help him in his ministry. But God saw that he got to go first. And I'll never forget the phone call when I got it. They said, preacher. And I said, yeah. They said, can you get to the hospital? And said, he's asking for you. And I remember get in my car and I raced up there. He made such an impact here in Lubbock. 
all the football team was there, all the cheerleaders were there, all the news media was there. And I remember when I walked in that corridor, you could barely walk down without hitting people on each side. It was just lying. He had made such an impact. And I'll never forget that whenever the nurse grabbed my hand and started to pull me through the crowd, we went to the very far back, that little room, and she opened the door, and as soon as I, she, in a sense, almost shoved me in, and she closed the door behind, there that young man was laying uh, on the bed. It was his last, you know, few minutes left, and, and his mom was there. She was laying beside him, and she smiled, and she said, he's been asking for you. And I said, I'm here. And he was looking all around, started, he was looking all around, just breathing very rapidly. And his little pale body was there and, and, uh, and he would have been hot, you know, when you had cancer and chemo and stuff. And so, and he was laying there actually in his, in his underwear and he was laying on the bed with his mom and she was just caressing him and loving on him. He was looking all around and I stopped and I spoke. I said, listen, I said, it's okay. And he didn't look at me at this moment. I'm at the end of the bed. The nurse is over here. Mom's over here. He's right here. And all of a sudden, and by the way, his name was Sean. I, I, I'm going to go and give you his full name, Sean McDaniels. All right? As a testimony to him. And Sean was there. And I said, Sean, I said, I want you to look around the room. And I want you to find Jesus. And I, I promise you. It was the most powerful time in my life. I'm standing there at the bed, and all of a sudden, Sean looked right here to my shoulder, right here. And he just stared. I said, Sean, when you see Jesus, it's okay. I want you, we talked about this. I said, when the time comes, he'll come for you. And if you see him, it's okay to go with him. And Sean looked over at me just for a second, grinned. And looked right back over and never took his eyes off of this shoulder over here. And we talked for a moment. And then we went back and reassured him that it was okay, that we are going to be okay. And mom said, John, we're going to be okay. It's okay to go home. The nurse was standing there with tears in her eyes. I was, my heart was pounding, but yet with a peace like I've never experienced and about that time, I said, Sean, it's time. It's time to go home. And Sean took a big, deep breath. And when the air went out, because I'd reached over and walked around, was holding his little hand on one side. Mom was holding it on the other. See, as a preacher, we were there for those moments to help people. And I remember he went, <sighs> his eyes closed. And... Starla, I was really shocked. I've, I've held a lot of hands, but I've never held a hand that just went cool so quick. What are you saying, preacher? I knew he wasn't there no more. He had gone home. You see, we know that before you can call yourself a Christian or any other denomination that's out there, you've got to be human. And I want to make sure that I'm a human to anyone who needs a human at that time. So define your purpose my purpose now at this stage in my life is to end well. Might not have done so well, Maddie, in the past, but I want to end well now. That's my purpose, to present the gospel to everyone that I can as often as I can, to be the husband and mate my wife should have and that a wife deserves, all right? To be a friend that Brother James will never let you down. I'll always be there for you guys. And you say, well, I, people aren't around all the time. Well, as long as you put me on the bottom of your list, when you run out of all the people that you could normally call on and nobody's there, make sure I'm on the bottom of your list and then you call me and I'll be there for you. I won't, I won't run away unless the Lord takes me home. I'm going to be there, all right? I want to, to be the one who, who's there from, like I said, from birth to the grave. So... And I noticed this, uh, you're right, I uh, asked you to help me to make up a sermon this morning, and you popped off. Well, the shoe has, it has a tongue. We know that. 
It has a tongue. And so uh, my question is, how is your tongue being used today? Do we as children of God spend more time speaking of Christ and singing praising and sharing the gospel? Or, or do we use our tongues to be all about us and, and to create hurt and to bring misery? Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one whose rash words are like swords thrust, but the tongue uh, of the wise brings healing. My purpose is to help bring healing in these last days. As children of God, our tongues have a lot of power. And Proverbs 18, 21 confirms, confirms this by saying, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. James 1, 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, that man's religion is in vain. So when you're holding that shoe there, and you're going through the deal. Remember, it had a maker. Remember that, of course, it had a, a purpose. And then also remember that every shoe has a tongue. And you get to decide how to use that. Well, what about this? If you notice this right here, Lady Carol, there's some eyes on here. Every shoe has eyes. Now, I don't have time to read Numbers chapter 21. But make a note. Go back today and just read Numbers chapter 21 and remember Read Numbers chapter 21 and remember, one can find life if they look to the crucified one. Now in John chapter 3, it's very, very uh, a sensitive subject for some people because some people may not believe the Bible, but I do. And I, I believe that if you'll take the time to just read a little bit of it, I think that maybe the same conviction that came into my heart might possibly come into yours. So in John chapter 3, if you will, look, and it says here in uh, uh, verse number uh, 14, John, St. John chapter 3 verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever what believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look down to verse number 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. So you see, we ought to have eyes Eyes that look to a Savior. Eyes that realize that I take a good look at myself and realize that, Maddie, I, I'm, not, I'm not fit to be in the presence of a holy God. Adam and Eve made sure of that when they sinned and, and that they had to be casted out of the Garden of Eden. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to be one of those that has to be casted out. I want to be received back in. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man come to the Father but by me. We ought to put our eyes on Jesus Christ, all right? And then every shoe, uh, I, think, I think, Dustin, you said, it has a soul. Now, that's a S-O-L-E, but you are a S-O-U-L. But when I look at that, I realize that every shoe has a soul. Mark 8, 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Quickly turn as we close this out to Luke chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 16. There we go. Turn to Luke chapter 16. I want you to see this when even Jesus Christ talks about in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. He talks about that soul. In fact, he says this, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at the gate full of sores and designed to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now look at verse 22 of Luke 16. Verse 22, And it came to pass, circle that, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was 
buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Remember, these are the words of Jesus. But Abraham said, Son, what? Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, but thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf that's fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you, they cannot, circle that if you will, they cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So out beside that put no escape. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that they may testify unto them, unless they come into this place of what? Torment. Circle that. Abram said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, nay, but no, oh, oh, oh no. He said, hey, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He understood the word repentance. Verse 31, he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So as I close this down, I realize that there are some eyes. We all have eyes that look into the future, Brother James. The fact is, everyone born is going to have a small amount of time and they will die. Every tombstone has a birth date, a death date, and a dash Right now we're in the dash, but I don't know how close we are to the death date. It could be today for any of us. But last of all, for repairs, a shoe must be taken to the right person. Galatians 6, 1, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. See, only a shoemaker can fix it. Only a living Christ can fix us. We must come to Christ, our maker, for the remedy of the sin and what sin has done to you and I. And the shoe leather, now here it is, this is the last one. The shoe leather, all right, is from a hide, which means it was provided by a sacrifice. Animals are slain to provide hide for most of our shoes today. Christ died to provide salvation for us. Romans 10, 9 through 13 it says that if thou shalt confess, here it is, guys, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God is raising from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto, or believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto what, Brother James? Salvation. The Bible's real clear. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that do what? That call upon him. Lady Carol, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Romans 10, 13. What about you today? Are you, are you ready to take and realize that, hey, listen, life is coming to an end for a lot of people. It'll come to an end for you and I. And let's, let's you know, it's amazing the lessons we can learn just from a shoe. Lady Carol, I'm, I'm going to thank you that you yielded that shoe to me today for an illustration. And I hope today that you'll yield your life uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ today. That you'll be, realize that you're just a human and, and, and in your shoes, wherever you walk, just be a human. Wherever you go, share it with somebody. One of the greatest things I saw was a, a missionary. Uh, he was, had a backpack and he was going down the road and, and, and he looked over there. And there was a, literally a man with no shoes, never had shoes in his life. So he reaches in his backpack and pulls out his secondary shoes. He pulls them out and he looks at them and they're pretty worn and battered. So what did he do? Brother James, he took off his good shoes and he gave it to the man who had no shoes and he put his old worn and tattered shoes on and he wore those. You know what Christ did? He, had, he was sinless, but he took on your sins. He, he put on your sins and my sins upon himself so that one day we could walk 
into the presence of Almighty God. Listen, don't get so blinded by what's going on in the world that you don't take a, like these eyes, you don't take a good look at, about eternity and realize that through Jesus Christ you can have everlasting life. So what do I do? It's simple. It's simple. Starley, you, like the thief on the cross, you look to Jesus and say, I deserve this. I cannot be in the presence of a holy God. I know that. But I believe that you're a God. I believe you have a kingdom. And the best I know how, I'm asking you to come into my heart Save me. Take me to where you are that I might live with you forever. And Jesus turned to him and said, what? Today. He sealed his destiny. See where you're going to be. Listen, don't be like Luke 16, 19 through 31, like the rich man. that If he have saw himself actually going to hell, I believe he would, hopefully he would have made a different decision. But without Jesus Christ, that's where we're going. Most preachers won't preach it anymore. But I'm telling you, I want to stand before God and say, at least I told everybody I could about you. And I said, don't look at me because I'm just a sinner like everybody else. I need a Savior just like you do. And there was a time when I asked Jesus into my heart. Now, after I got saved, did I live a great life for Jesus? No, I was too selfish. But I'm at a point in time in my life, I realize I'm now a bride to Christ. And it's time for me to clean a lot of things up. And I want to end well before it's over. How about you? Can you be that one that could be there for like a Sean McDaniels? That even to the end, they call out your name to be with you. Father, I pray that if there's one that's listening to this and those that will take time to share this, that Lord, that you would literally allow this to go out to everyone and that the Holy Spirit of God would anoint it in a way that people could hear and feel the message that you are trying to bring to them today. So, Father, I pray, if there's one that's not truly, truly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, that right now, that they would realize, number one, that they too are a sinner, they're just human, and then, Lord, realize that they can't fix it, but you can. And they look to you, that the one who hung on the cross, died for their sins, rose again, and now is alive forevermore, our Creator. And if we'll just ask you, You'll save us. So here it is. Lord Jesus, the best I know how, I confess I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart once and for all. Save me right here, right now, and forever. And then I ask that your Holy Spirit, as he enters in, to help mold me and shape me in my mind and in my heart and in my life to be a reflection of you to a lost and dying world that they'll want the same Jesus that I found today. I love you. Thank you for saving me. Hugs and kisses in Jesus' name. And be sure, if you will, check out our website at lyitl.org for lovingthelord.org. There's a lot of information on there. And just spend your time, just spend a couple of minutes a day trying to get the gospel to anyone that will listen. God bless you all. Amen.